a couple of people things real quick. First of all, he's mad. Second of all, uh, Joanne and Roger Harmon, where, could you just kind of raise your hand where you are? They, they want to place membership here, so we're grateful that they're among us now. Thank you very much, and we, we enjoy putting you all to work and being encouraged by you, and we want to encourage you as well. And, and some of you just didn't realize, Elise Mooney, right? I'm going to make you just hold up your hand. There you go. She was baptized last Sunday shortly after uh, people left, and so uh, I just want you to know, delightful family, and she's great, and she's going to be a blessing to the world and to God's kingdom, and so we're grateful for that. Also, um, we have a birthday today. Is the picture? Does it, can anybody guess who this is? Okay, so you got to—I don't know, probably 18, 19 there. I don't know how old, but he's now 90. Can any? I want you to fast forward this 90 years. Who do you think that looks like? Well, uh, you're not Billy Simpkins. Where is he? Is he even here? Is he? He's not able to be here. I hate that, but I want you to know. You get his phone number or text or something. He's 90 years old today, I believe I said his birthday. And so we're going to celebrate that with him and congratulate him on that. Um, if you will be making your way to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we'll be there in a moment. And I hope uh, that you guys are planning on being back tonight. If you can, we're going to do some great singing in the fellowship room back there. Some scripture readings, just some thoughts together. And, and, and enjoy just, we're, we're just going to be a bunch of chairs set up out there. Sing a little bit with the screens that we've got and using the words off the screens. And, and it will be a time for us to be together and just have some fun tonight. So uh, be planning on coming back tonight if at all possible. I've got a peppermint in my mouth. It's going to stay there because I don't know if in the last couple of weeks you've noticed this. But if you take the Lord's Supper and the, and, the, and the bread is not the kind you break but the kind you pick up. Lately it's tasted funky. Has anybody noticed this? Now, I don't take this, and I don't sit there and evaluate what it tastes like, but when it tastes like kerosene, I take notice. So this, I'd heard about that, and I thought I'll try it this morning, because I usually like to break it off. That's kind of my deal. But, but the last few weeks have been taken, and today I got one like everybody's been talking about. And so after service, I came down here to try out some more and found two or three more like that. No one lied a match, okay, is all I can say. You'll get the worst hellfire brimstone sermon you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> Right here on a holiday time. It was terrible. And so we've taken all that out. Don't worry, it won't happen because we've, we, we, we took it all out, replaced it all. But it was just really strange. So if you've had that lately, notice that we, we are rectifying that whatever weird problem uh, kerosene-filled Lord's Supper bread uh, is. Uh, you never knew that taking Lord's Supper could cost you your life. Uh, that's what he's talking about, First Corinthians 11. Anyway. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. If you, um, if you experience something and you were taught as a kid how to do this, but you don't, you, you kind of take it for granted and you don't teach the next generation, they won't, they won't know what used to be known by everybody. I, don't, I hope that makes sense, but I think we've kind of lost a little bit in our culture about the, the art of giving and receiving gifts. And this is a perfect time to talk about this. How many of you really struggle every find anything. You got people who have everything they, they could possibly want. You call around and say, well, I don't need anything. And you say, well, it's not about need. Well, I don't really want anything because if I want something, I go get it. And so I'm not going to wait till Christmas for this. And so every year you're just trying to figure out something to give them, to give them something when they don't really need or want anything. It becomes very difficult. And then, then you try to debate this. You know, you see the Hallmark movies and some families I'll break them all open at the same time. And some of them one at a time. And do you say thanks? And what do you do? Do you send them a thank you card for the gift? And all these kind of, I, I just want to, I just want to decide uh, the greatest person 
to give instruction on how to give and receive gifts is God himself. And it seems like we need to look at this just a little bit. Because if you're one of those people that, that don't put much thought into it, and you give the same thing every year, you need, you need this lesson today. If you're one of those that your family draws names, and when everybody finds out that you, or when somebody finds out that you drew their name, they're really disappointed because you're a terrible gift giver. Or maybe your family has gotten so used to those, those that they don't draw names anymore because nobody knows how to give gifts anymore. You need to listen to this lesson today. This is going to help you some. How to give and how to receive gifts. And the perfect example of God. Now I'm pretty creative. I could I could bring I thought about bringing up a crutch, but I, I'm one is I'm sitting there thinking about the things that happened in the last year, some things that people need, and and then I, I go off I, I go off the grid. I come up with something like like I have a bobblehead that's made to look like my father-in-law, and it sits in his container. Now, but he got it one year, and I said to his wife, and I said, if you ever have to ask him something, he always says no. Give him this bobblehead and just make it. Frank, will you wash the dishes? And she. Now, it doesn't make him do the dishes, but it makes her have a pleasant thought about it. I also got him a, 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 a stuffed doll that looks like him with pins. You know, so it's like a voodoo doll, and you stick him. And I said, you're ever frustrated with him? You just, you know, it's terrible. You shouldn't do that, and it's against our religion. But anyway, it's just fun. <laughs> But there's all sorts of gifts like that over the years that, that have been fun to give that are kind of just nobody's expecting. But even with all that, and even if I get good at that, I'm never anything like the kind of gift giver that God is. Our Father is. There's three major gifts that He's given you. And I want you to start this week as we're talking about a gift giving week. I want you to, to think about this this week. The first gift He gives is this. He, every good and perfect gift is from God. All all good things come from him. So here's what I want. I want you to say this. Uh, here's the, and I'm going to point to you and you're just going to say it. So you've got to be watching me, right? If it's good, it's God. So everybody say it. That wasn't a lot of conviction. Let's try this wisdom. Like, you, like, like maybe you know that you mean it. Okay, ready? If it's good, it's God. If it's good, it's God. And that's what he's saying in James chapter 1. If it's good, if you've got something in your life that's good... Look to your right, look to your left. If your family is good, Lisa Horton's got a bunch of them here today. And she's looking as if your family's good, you know what? That's God. If your health's pretty good, it's God. If you've had some food this week, if you have a nice house to live in, if it's good, it's God. Right? So if it's good, it's God. you guys are terrible. You guys are terrible. Let's try it again. You ready? If it's good, it's God. That's right. And we've got to say it because that's what he's saying, James 1. Now, here's the context. In James chapter 1, he's just talked about all the temptations and trials. And then he, and he says, uh, uh, first of all, the trials and then the temptations. And these people are saying, we think, we think God is tempting us. We think God's coming out here to test us and make us trip up. And James says, no, that's not true. Don't be deceived, guys. Don't let yourselves fall to this lie that God's just trying to trip me up and, 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 and make me fall. He's not. Our God. God is a God. The only thing he gives is good stuff to his children. And so therefore he's saying if it's good, it's God. If it's good, it's God. It's what in James chapter 1. It's so all these good gifts. This is a whole bunch of categories of these. And I could list a bunch of these. And you would, you would know, yeah, yeah. And I could, I could say to you, what's one good thing that happened to you this week? I'll do that with teenagers sometimes. And I'll go, I don't know. I can't link them anything. And there's dozens of them. We could make a list. I just want to say, if anything good, it's God. If it's good, it's God. So what does God want us to do with these? God doesn't just tell us that he's given us every good thing, but he says, I, 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 want, I want to tell you how I want you to use what I give you. I want to, God delights. It's not something that he makes himself do. He delights in giving. In fact, in fact, his first real experiment with the promised land was this. Can I, can I just bless my people into obedience? Can I just bless them and they love me? No, it didn't work that way. But he'd like to try. And if anything good has happened to you, it's God. And he's saying, I want you to... So here's what he wants you to do. Here's your response to the gift. Be thankful. 
the last few weeks, I love the holiday season of Christmas because it lasts so long. I, every worship service or gathering that we've had in the last three weeks, when I go back to my office, there's something really nice there. Last week it was this tin full of this really thick peanut brittle. It had my name on the top. I knew it was mine because it had my name on it. it. didn't say Furby's. It said Spencer. First thing that runs through my mind is, is that what I think it is? I reach in there and I just, ooh, yeah, that's the first thing. Second thing is, who's this from? You know those stickers are there for a reason. We buy them for a reason. It's to, I want to know who it's to, and I want to know who it's from. And I look at that sticker because I'm going to tell you, it, it, the gift is not as good as it can be until you thank the giver. Until you've done that, it's not as fulfilling as it can be. I can thank them in any number of ways. You thank them so that it will recur. <laughs> when I tell you, you Layla made that peanut brittle, I'm securing that next year, I'm going to get another 10. And I want to keep doing this. As long as she's living and I'm living, let's make this happen. And, and there's all sorts of things. Uh, you're supposed to think, and, and, and God says this the same way. He says, I want you to thank me for everything. You know how many verses God says, I want you to be thankful to me for everything? I want you to say, because I want you to know where they come from. And one of the, one of the weirdest things for God, the, the most unfortunate thing, is God gives these gifts to everybody, believers and unbelievers alike. He, he sends all these things, but guess what? The air we breathe doesn't come with a sticker. The food you eat does not come. You would swear, if you were watching the process, you go to Walmart, you buy it, you bring it home, you prepare it. You would swear that it's from you. But I'm telling you this, if it's good, it's... I'm telling you, even the food you eat that you prepared, that you bought with your money at a store, even that's from God, isn't it? It's, it's easy to miss it because there isn't a sticker. But God tells us in his word, he interprets life for us. And he says to us, what? If it's, it's God. Put that in your head. He says, I want you to be thankful. And then he says, secondly, I want to see you enjoying it. I want to see you enjoying it. Listen to this passage that was read a moment ago. And I'm going to give you a, I want you to notice the underlined words. The Ecclesiastes writer has said, I've, I've seen, I've witnessed life, and I've traced the record in the book of Ecclesiastes about what life's all about. But I love this last part. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions, that's one gift. I've given you stuff. Every good and perfect gift came from me. And the power to enjoy them. Two different gifts. Now why is that important? Because an awful lot of times God has gifted people. He's given them many blessings. But you know what? All they want is more. And they work for more. And they just take it for granted. And they don't even think about it being from God. And they get more. And they get more. And the stuff that God gives us becomes a barrier to enjoying them. God says there's a second touch altogether. If I've given you wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, that's the gift from God. Lots of people with lots of things don't know it's from God. Don't appreciate it, don't enjoy them, and they become a curse rather than a blessing. God wants you to enjoy them. If you had the impression that yet yeah, God wants you to get all this stuff and then give it back to him and you live miserable lives as like a monk in some convent somewhere, or a monk in some, well, that, that doesn't make sense. No. Monastery, thank you. Gender switch. But is it, we go, if you think that's what God's like, he's wanting you to take, no, he wants you, he wants you to enjoy it. So all these good things that God gives you, listen, thank him for them over and over again. And don't get tired of it. God doesn't get tired of that. And enjoy them. I want you to know, I really enjoy you, Layla's peanut butter, peanut butter. I enjoy that. And there are other things people have given. I've gotten gift cards from people, and, and I enjoy them. And I'm going to tell them so. And I think it delights them. And you know what? It really delights God when he sees you enjoying the things he's given because you can't fully enjoy them when you don't know where they're from and you're not thankful for them. It's all part of that. 
second kind of gift God gives us is the gift of salvation. And the gift language is prevalent here. Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Free gift? Free gift. Next line. Next screen, I mean. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not something you worked for. It's a gift. If you're saved this morning, you're in a right relationship with God, and you enjoy a right relationship with God, peace with Him, and harmony with Him, and you've already reserved your spot in heaven to enjoy eternity with Him, I'm going to tell you this. It wasn't because you deserved it, and it wasn't because you earned it or paid it off. It's because He gave it to you. The only way to get that peace and salvation and joy is as a gift. And it drives a lot of people crazy. I want to be able to work it off. I want to be able to somehow earn it. And God says you can't do that. The only way you can do that is to take the gift of my son, which we've celebrated this morning already, and to receive it. Third one is, for God so loved the world, he gave. He gave his only son. There is an exclusive ownership of the only God can grant this. And those who are Christians and who say Jesus is the only way, we're not being uh, uh, intentionally exclusive to hold it back from everybody else. We're saying to everyone, there's only one place that carries this blessing, and it's God the Father. And you can only get it by receiving it. What does God want us to do with this gift? The first response is he wants you to receive it. If we go back up to Galatians chapter 2, if you would back up, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, a couple slides up. I want you to notice this. That is by grace, but it's through faith. You notice that? You've been saved by grace through faith. You have to believe it, and you have to respond to it in a way that God has said. Because God wants to offer this. By the way, who did Jesus come to die for? Just Christians or everybody? Everybody. He died for the sins of the whole world, 1 John chapter 2. He wants everyone to get the benefits, everyone to receive the blessing. He wants it. He offers it to everybody, but not everybody wants it. There's this thing, and I'm, I'm not sure who puts it in the newspaper. Some of you will know this. William McLean tried to tell me who it was. But there's this thing in the newspaper every once in a while saying misplaced funds or misplaced money or whatever. Somebody's moved off or maybe they've got an inheritance and they didn't even know it and they've been gone for a long time. In the newspaper, these names appear of people who have money and things that they own that they, they've lost and the state has become in possession of. And all you have to do is re find your name and call that number and it says, hey, yeah, you got some money. Maybe you've left it or maybe somebody left it for you and you didn't know it and it's just sitting here and it can't be used. If you wait three or four years, it becomes a possession of the state, but we're trying to find, we've got to try to find the people. And so you look at your name and if you see your name, you call that number and they send you the check or they send you whatever the property is that you didn't even realize you had. What a cool thing. Now, I wish I could tell you how that works, but the only way I could ever tell you how that works is if my name was in that list. And my name has never been on that list, although I've checked very carefully many times. If you want to leave me something unbeknownst to me, that's okay. But I'd really rather know it so that I can use it, right? But in the newspaper, all these names, and I can't imagine, why would anybody see their name in that list and not call the number? I said that, and William McLean says, you know what the state does? They put some felon names on there, hoping that the felons will try to come and claim it, and they'll nab them. I said, well, you just messed up the entire sermon illustration. Thank you very much. ASU professor of political science. Imagine having that. An avenue for this possession, something you didn't even know you had and it was going to be given to you, but you just won't call. That's what, that's what a lot of people in the world do. They just don't believe what God offers. They don't receive it. The second thing he wants you to do is he wants you to live it. He wants you to live it out. There's something about when you get something for Christmas, for instance, a new pair of shoes or a new gold ring or something, one of the things you want to do is you want to wear it and you want to brag about the person who gave it. He's going to shoot. 
and my wife got these for me, my son got me this, or you, you just want to brag about that, and rightly so, and God wants you to do that. He wants you to be, there's one thing we're told we're supposed to boast about in Scripture. You don't boast about your works. You don't boast about your uh, contribution to, the, uh, to, to believe in God. You, you boast in Jesus Christ. You want to show the world, you know what? I am a person who doesn't have to worry about my sin. You know why? Because Jesus took care of it. You boast about the giver and you boast about the gift. There are Sundays that I'll wear strange ties, all because Max and Doris Merrill drove up to the church building, and Max is a sharp dresser. I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but he will go out and he will buy. He will hand pick a shirt and a tie, and they'll bring it in, and they'll give it to me. And the next couple of Sundays, when I know they're going to be there, I want to wear that shirt and tie. I, I want to boast about what they did. Erin Poppleton will do that, too, but her ties look very funky. But anyway, it's, it's just the whole idea. Somebody gave me a gift, and I want to brag about the giver, and I want to brag about the gift. God says, when I've given you salvation and you've enjoyed it, I, I want to see you live in it so that others can see it too. Because I want everybody to have this. There's the gift of every good thing. There's the gift of salvation. And there's the, the last one that he gives us. The gift of a gift. Weird, isn't it? The gift of a gift. 1 Peter chapter 4. As each has received a gift... Now, this is weird, and we in the Churches of Christ don't talk about this as much, at least that I've heard. Each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, many different forms of it. Whoever speaks, if you have the gift of speaking, speak the very oracles of God. If you have the gift of serving, do it with the strength that God gives you in order that everything... In everything, God may be glorified. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Here's the deal. When you became a believer, when you were immersed into Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you are given a gift. I know this is true. Scripture affirms this in many places. Everybody's given at least one this is a weird thing. And you're like, what? God gifts me with a gift? That is right. God gives you a gift. A special ability or special talent that you have that he expects you to then use to bless and build up the kingdom. Now, what's your response to this gift? First of all, you need to identify it. A lot of believers are walking around being given a gift by God. They have no idea what it is, and so they aren't using it. And because they aren't using it, the kingdom isn't being built up, and they aren't being matured. I want you to know you have a job in the kingdom. God has blessed you with the ability to have a role to play to build up his kingdom. And when you don't use it, the kingdom suffers, but so do you. Because you're not making the contribution that you're equipped to make. He gives you a gift. Now, there's no, there's no exhaustive list in Scripture about what all these gifts are. It could be any number. There's people with the gift of discernment. There are people in my life that I've known from the church that whenever I'm really struggling with something, trying to figure out how this applies to my life, I'll call them up or I'll, I'll meet with them somewhere and we'll talk about this because they have this great gift of discernment. We have several here of the gift of giving. They, they make money. They're pretty good at it. But more than that, they don't have an attachment to it. And they're willing to give it away. There are people, and I'm looking at some of them, like Dennis and Janet Gregory, who have the gift of service. Tirelessly, They just keep giving of themselves and the talents that they have for people who build up the kingdom. I see some of you out there. Some have the gift of encouragement. Some have the gift of teaching like Risa and, and, and like uh, Kelly Phipps and others like that. There are people with a gift of hospitality that whenever you're around them, you feel like you're home. And they make you feel like you're comfortable. And they invite you to their house all the time. And invite you into their lives. Find out what your gift is and, and then use it to bless other people. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy. And, and I think this is a little bit of a reprimand. He says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. I don't want to give it God to give you this fire that he gives you and then you never use it and you never let it be used and all of a sudden it dies. I want you to fan it into flame by using it. Find out what your gift is. And the way you honor God for giving that gift is by using it for his purpose and that is to build up the kingdom of God and encourage each other. 
If it's good, it's God. God has given every good gift. God has given us salvation. And if you're a beneficiary today, then you know it's a gift. He's also given you a gift, and for every person it's a little different. You have a unique contribution to make, and God has blessed you with that. Now use it. God is demonstrating for us a generosity of giving gifts. You have received all three categories of these gifts in here. So we thank God and we enjoy them and we receive the offer of salvation and we accept it and we live it out and we use that gift he gives us to bless other people. He's the master teacher when it comes to giving gifts. And we've been made in his image after all. We've benefited from his generosity. So we would be natural, it would seem natural to me that we imitate God in our generosity of giving to others. All that you need to be a good gift giver and receiver is contained in the gospel message. You are able to give and receive gifts in the most powerful, gracious way because God has modeled it for you. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. We are the most gifted people on the planet and we know it. And we need to model it. If there's anyone here that God has been trying to gift you things, trying to bless you with things, and trying to let you know it's Him so that you can respond to Him by accepting His salvation and you live it out, and then that you use the gift He gives you to bless other people. If you have been, if God has been trying to get through to you and He hasn't been able to get through to you, and this morning you're like, I'm ready. Listen, we would love to all in here who've received this to watch you receive receive this gift this morning to open it up and start using it. We would love to witness that as a church. It happened last Sunday morning. Love to see it happen again. If you are subject to receiving this gift, it's being offered right now as we stand and as we sing. Break.